My friends, the Washington Nationals are the world champions of baseball. They won the playoffs. So you know we have to have a special dedication for them. We're going to read Willie and the All-Stars. And we're going to learn some history behind baseball as we read together. Hey, you guys, who's the greatest in this story? The Nationals are. Let's tell the Nationals, you are the greatest. Go ahead and tell them. And tell yourself why you're at it. I'm sure that'd be okay. Say, I am the greatest. Go Nationals. I'm so excited for them. How many of you like baseball? This is a fun story that we're going to share. Here we go. Willie lived with his grandma in a tiny one-room apartment on the north side of Chicago. It was 1942 and nothing came easy, not even a boy's dreams. Everything Willie loved best was there in that little apartment. Grandma, their radio, and the wad of tape and string Willie used as a baseball when he played stickball in the street. These are wonderful illustrations. Look at these. It was Willie's grandma who taught him to love baseball. As they settled into their seats in front of the old radio, Willie would close his eyes and feel just like he was at the Wrigley Field. His heart pumping to the sound of ball slamming into mitts sending puffs of old leather dust into the afternoon sunlight as waves of fresh cut grass tickled his nose. Someday he knew he would stand at home plate smashing a fastball deep into the center field for a home run. Look at Willie. Willie pretended he was playing baseball no matter what he was doing. A trip to the store quickly became a series of stolen bases from the curb to the lamppost to the fire hydrant to the mailbox until he slid safe at home without breaking an egg. Nothing made the dream feel more real than when Willie and his pals played stickball in the street. He would hear the cheers from the fans in his head as he pretended he was Joe DiMaggio in the center field or Dizzy Dean striking out batters. Major League stars were the best. Willie wanted to be the best too. One hot summer evening, Willie sat on his front stoop, listening to the gathering of old men as they spun tales of trickery and triumph. He clung to each word. Satchel Page throws his pitches so fast they make buzzing sounds before they disappear in front of home plate, said Mr. Wilson. Oh man, that ain't nothing, said another old man. I know of a cat so quick he can flick off the light switch and be in bed before the room gets dark. Cool Papa Bell, the man is that quick. Y'all ain't seen nothing, said old Ezra, till you've seen Josh Gibson hit. That fella once hit a ball so high and far, it still ain't come down. And that's the truth. The men hooted in laughter. Willie couldn't believe his ears. Why ain't I ever heard of these players on the radio, he asked. That's 
because they're Negro League players, said Mr. Wilson. You mean all of these players you've been talking about aren't even real major leaguers, Willie asked? How could how good could they be then? Oh, Ezra rolled up from the steps and looked Willie right in the eyes. Son, he said, being a major league ball player is all about a lot more than how good a fella is. It's also about the color of his skin, and yours is the wrong color. All of a sudden, Willie felt all closed up inside, almost like he was trapped in a box. You have to remember what year this was, guys. Do you remember what year I told you it was? I'll let you know why he was told what he was told. Of course, Willie wasn't the only boy with baseball dreams. He and his good pal, Sean O'Carroll, had spent hour after hour talking about how they were going to make it to the major league someday. I'm going to smack balls all over the outfield wall, just like Babe, Sean would say. You and me, Willie, we'll work hard together and play on the same team. Willie would usually laugh, but today he dropped his head. He thought about how he and Sean couldn't sit together on the trolley, how they had to drink from separate water fountains at the park. Oh, Ezra tells me, I ain't never going to play in the majors, said Willie. Sean put his hand on Willie's shoulder. You don't know that for sure, he said. Old Ezra may know a lot, but he doesn't know everything. The next day, they saw old Ezra standing out on the stoop, talking with some men. One of them put something in Ezra's pocket and gave him a great big hug before driving away in a fancy looking car. As the boys walked past, old Ezra stopped Willie. Willie, he shouted, just the fella I'm looking for. Keep your chin up and take these, he said putting an envelope in Willie's shirt pocket. It's time he learned a little something about baseball. Willie thanked old Ezra, looked in the envelope, and broke out into the biggest smile Sean had ever seen before. What do you think it is, guys? What did old Ezra give Willie? What is it, Sean said. Willie held up two tickets from the envelope. Sean broke out into the second biggest smile ever as he read the tickets. Admission to an exhibition baseball game between the Negro League All-Star team and the Major League All-Stars. Willie couldn't even believe his eyes. He was there in a place he never thought he would see. A place where men became legends. A place Willie and kids like him could only go in their imaginations. This was Wrigley's field. Willie took it all in. He wanted to remember for Grandma every single detail. He would tell her how he and Sean saw all the greats, the very ones that he heard about play on the radio. And then there were the Negro League players, a ragtag collection they were, 
in uniforms tattered and faded from too many trips up and down the backcountry roads. Shoes softened and worn with age and memories of two or three games a day. Baseball gloves patched up, tied and retied too many times. These players joked around and played games in front of the dugout as they warmed up. Don't they realize who it is they're going to play, Willie wondered. There was Satchel Paige driving a nail through a post with his infamous b-ball pitch. There was Josh Gibson just playing around, sending a ball so high into the sky it probably wouldn't come down till midnight. Willie and Sean saw through the legs, catches, and behind the back throws. The Negro Leaguers were fast and talented for sure. But could they really compete with the best? The game was tough fought to the bitter end, and each team played hard to win. But from the first pitch, the Negro League team seemed a bit hungrier for the victory. They stretched singles into doubles and doubles into triples and even stole home for a score. They hit harder, ran faster, and just plain out muscled the major league team for a win. The crowd went wild at the display they just seen. And the Negro League players hugged each other in joy. Then something happened that made Willie catch his breath. Two opposing players, one from each team, found their way through the hoopla in the fray and met each other face to face atop the pitcher's mound. The whooping and hollering stopped with a jolt as the crowd watched in astonishment. What scary happened? Take a guess. What's going to happen? Two players, one black and one white, shook hands. A nod of acknowledgement, if not acceptance, from white to black. Author's note, back when baseball was first played, when it held promise for any dreamer with enough talent and luck, any man could put his skills on the line and go as far as he could play. It didn't matter if he was black, brown, or white. Baseball was in a sense young and open for all. In 1888, all that changed when baseball, perhaps reflecting the social climate of the times, banned players of color from major league participation. Untold dreams were snuffed out and superb talent was stifled. Negro League Baseball was formed as an answer to the closed hand of Major League Baseball. It started out with rag teams called Brain, the Barnstormers. The teams were made up of talented 
players pulled together from wherever and who would travel the back roads in search of nothing more than a field to play on and teams to challenge. Free from confines and rules of the majors, the Negro League game evolved into a loser, faster, some would say more entertaining brain of, bas of baseball as promoters sought to increase fans' attendance and keep the seats filled. The Barnstormers had it rough. They traveled the dusty back roads of America, oftentimes playing several games into a single day for very meager pay. Along the way, they brought baseball to thousands of game-starved fans who would otherwise be denied the experience of this home-bred sport. As a legend of Negro League's best group, it attracted the attention of the major league owners who were fighting dwindling attendance as America fought in the war overseas. This led to opportunity in the all-star games pitting Negro Leaguers versus Major Leaguers. Many such contests were held and more often than not, the Negro Leaguers came out on top. Who knew how many dreams were kindled by their determination? Willie and the All-Stars is about one such dream that may have been inspired by this period in the history of America's pastime. The end. Did I mention that Willie and the All Stars is by Floyd Cooper? You guys, I hope you enjoyed this story. And maybe it would be fun to do some research on who gave that handshake because it's true, it really did happen. so proud of the history of baseball before we go you know Miss V wants to share a hug a kiss peace and love good job nationals <laughs>